We are in our series, The Spirit, The Holy Spirit Yearns. And last week was our second week, and we talked about the fact that the Holy Spirit yearns to convict the world. Uh, and we walked away with many truths, but this morning I just want us to pick up on three of them. The first one is the fact that the Holy Spirit yearns to convict the world because he loves the world. Amen. And then also the Holy Spirit com, uh, convicts the world concerning sin, Jesus' righteousness, and judgment with the purpose to draw the world to Jesus so that they can be reconciled with God. Amen? And also we talked about the fact that the Holy Spirit was sent to the disciples. The Holy Spirit was sent to us, to the believers, and not directly to the world because the convicting work of the Holy Spirit involves us. It involves every single believer. We have our place to play in all of this. Amen? Amen. So today we pick it up from there, and I just want to remind you of what Jesus says, said in John 16. Let's read verse 7, and then we'll jump to 12 and 13. Verse 7 says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Verse 12, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak of his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. Now remember, here Jesus is talking to his, his disciples, telling them, hey, I will send you a helper, I have to go. But he is coming and he'll tell you more than what you've learned from me. He'll teach you more. And everything that he will tell you will be aligned with the Father and the Son. So when he talks about the fact that not of his own authority, meaning he's not going to teach you anything that's new, that's contradicting what the Father say or what the Son say, because he is God. So we are all speaking the same thing. This is what Jesus is saying here, that the Holy Spirit will teach us the truth that he, Jesus, and the Father agrees with. Now, sometimes we tend to forget this because we have the entire Bible, that Jesus, when he was speaking here, the New Testament was not even written, right? So he's telling his disciples, and these are the disciples, as a matter of fact, that come to be with the Holy Spirit. They are indwelled and empowered by the Holy Spirit, and they're the ones actually who write the New Testament through the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. So Jesus is saying he will show you all truth. He's, he will guide you through all truth. And these are the disciples that were led to know all this truth that we now today read as our New Testament. And as we read, it's the same Holy Spirit that inspired the disciples to write that is teaching us through that all the truth that God wants us to know. Amen? So Jesus just promised the disciples a helper who is the Holy Spirit who will come and teach us all truth. And the Holy Spirit convicts. We learned that last week. He convicts the world. So he will bring to the world the truth about Jesus, the truth about their fallenness and the truth about Jesus and the judgment to come so that the world will accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior, and they will be reconciled with God. But when that happens, it is the Holy Spirit that breathes new life into this new believer so that they have eternal life. But not only that, he indwells them. He starts living inside them. So if you're a believer, you have the Holy Spirit living inside you right this very moment. And he's always there. You've become his home. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Actually, Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 6, uh, from verse 19 to 20. He says, do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit, whom is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Paul is saying, listen, um, we were supposed to pay for our sins, but Jesus bought that sin. He died on our behalf. So we've been bought by Jesus so that these bodies are no longer ours. They've become a temple of the Holy Spirit. When we are saved, the Holy Spirit, can you imagine God himself living inside us? God himself living with us, 
constantly, not just one time, but all the time. Amen? Now, I have a question for you this morning. We know that the Holy Spirit lives in us. The Holy Spirit, who is God, resides with us. Not just sometimes, not just on Sundays, not just when you are at church, not just when you are connect group, but all the time. He's constantly there. Now, my question is, does he feel welcomed? Does he feel welcome in you, in your body, in your heart? Does the Holy Spirit feel at home? Are the things that we are thinking, the things that we are doing, actually saying, Holy Spirit, you're welcome? Because we can sing that all we want. Holy Spirit, you're welcome. Holy Spirit, come. We want more of you. Come. We want to experience you. We want to experience your glory. We can say it. But are our actions saying, you're welcome? You know, this morning when I was thinking of this, a little funny, I started thinking, well, what if I was to invite someone and say, you know what, I'm having a barbecue and I invite all these friends and then one of them happens to be a vegan. And I said, you know what, I have barbecue and I'm going to have all these types of meat and everything. And they say, well, but I'm a vegan. Oh, yeah, yeah, just come along. And they come to this barbecue and they're like, okay, so what can I eat? And I just have all this spread of like different type, you know, chicken, pork and beef and all of this and sausage and all of that and say, well, what can I have? Oh, yeah, I made you an egg salad. Would that person feel welcome? They are vegan. They don't even eat eggs. You know, but I said, no, but I want you to come. But I have done nothing to prepare to welcome them. There is nothing in that barbecue in my home that says you are actually welcome. Even though I invited them. So as believers, when we say, Holy Spirit, you are welcome. Our thoughts, our deeds, do they actually say, Holy Spirit, you're welcome? Do they make him comfortable? Because he's with us. He's constantly with us. Are the things that we are doing in the darkness making the Holy Spirit comfortable? Or is he constantly uncomfortable? Remember, the Holy Spirit is a person. He has a personality. He has emotions. And he yearns to be loved and to be embraced. Is that how he feels in you? He's a person with divine will and purpose. And he yearns for his works in us to be embraced. Is that the case? In ourselves, in our gatherings, in our church. So today we're going to look at this truth. The Holy Spirit yearns to be embraced. The Holy Spirit yearns to be embraced, and he yearns to be embraced by those that he dwells with. He longs to feel welcomed, needed, loved, and appreciated. He earnestly yearns to hear, Holy Spirit, you are welcome, not just by our words, but by our actions and even our thoughts. Unfortunately, Many believers, we say this, Holy Spirit, you're welcome. We sing it. We say, we, we embrace you, Holy Spirit. And to some extent, it is true. But I wonder if we truly, fully embrace the Holy Spirit. With everything that's in us. And I believe this is what Paul was reminding the believers in 1 Thessalonians verse 5, 16 to 22. He started in 16, we'll start with 16. He says, rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Now here Paul is, this is just the end of a list of things that he was reminding the believers in Thessalonica um, to, to do as instructions for their integrities as, as true Christians. But he ends with, this command, do not quench the spirit. Do not quench the spirit. 
Do not treat prophecies with contempt, but test them and hold on to what is good. Reject every kind of evil. So these were closing instructions to, to the church in Thessalonica. This is chapter five. You truly should go back and, and read the entire chapter and in, read the entire book of uh, First Thessalonians to really understand this. But this is Paul closing here, and he's stressing to the believers and their responsibility of guarding their spiritual integrity. And he says, do not quench the spirit. You see, in the original text, this verb to, to quench means to, to suppress or to stifle a flame, something that is burning and, and you are just suppressing it so it doesn't burn as how it was burning before. See, the Holy Spirit is a fire. It's like a fire that dwells in each believer. He burns within us. He reminds us of who we are, he he works in us and he makes us be on fire for the Lord. So this command that Paul is giving us as believers is very important. And he also gave this very similar one to, to, um, to Timothy when he said to keep ablaze the gift of God in you. Keep it on fire. Do not stifle the fire in you. Do not stifle, do not quench the Holy Spirit. But truly, if we're to look at the lives of believers today, it's almost as if we've posted this big sign and say, Holy Spirit, you cannot come here. We say, you're welcome. But when we look at our lives, sometimes it's almost like we're saying, you can't come here. And sometimes we say, well, you can come this far, come up to this area, but don't touch that. Don't come to this area. I only allow you this far. Holy Spirit, you know, I love you. I want you to come, but just end here. You know, we do things in a very subtle way that communicates to the Holy Spirit that he does not well, he's no welcome in all parts of our lives. We say, Holy Spirit, we, we want you to come and secure our salvation. Come and secure my salvation. Come and give me eternal life, but don't come too close to disrupt the way I live my life. The Holy Spirit comes and starts convicting us of, of things that we do or maybe the way that the places of work that we are. And you say, oh, Holy Spirit, come on. I want that eternal life, but you want me to quit my job here? How am I going to live the life that I have? How am I going to keep up with the Joneses? You know, how am I going to buy the new latest car that is out there? Holy Spirit, come. Because I want all your blessings. I want your help. I want your healing. I want you to touch my family and restore my family. But just, I want all your power in that area. But just not too much power that is manifested physically in me. You know, we don't want too much of the Holy Spirit power to be manifested in us physically. And what I mean by this, even in our a freedom to worship with the Holy Spirit, we hold back when we start sensing, you know, the Holy Spirit, even when it comes to the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, I want all your power, but yeah, don't give me that weird language, that prayer language, not for me. I'm too sophisticated for that. You know, Holy Spirit, we want your power to come and restore our marriage, but not too close that people will feel your power and be slain in spirit and fall on their knees and pray and fall on their faces. No, we don't want that. The Holy Spirit, we're too sophisticated for that. Come close enough to bless us with our finances, but not too close that we'll be crying and weeping when we experience your glory and your presence at church. So we end up stifling the power of the Holy Spirit. We are telling the Holy Spirit, 
we want you, but just this much. Not the whole of you. Just the, as much as we want. This is not embracing the Holy Spirit. He yearns to be fully embraced. Now, there's so many ways we can quench the power of the Holy Spirit. And we cannot go through all of them today. So we're going to talk about three of them. Amen? We quench the Holy Spirit when we first rely decisively on any resource other than the Holy Spirit. You see, God has given us the Holy Spirit to help us with everything. Not just some things, it's everything. Let's read what Paul says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 11. He says, with this in mind, we constantly pray for you that our God may make you worthy of his calling and that by his power, everybody say his power, this is the Holy Spirit power, he may bring to fruition your every desire for goodness and your every deed prompted by faith. Every single one of us has a calling in their lives. Some of you are called to marketplaces, health sectors, education sectors, ministries, missions. Everyone has a calling. Wherever you are, God has called you to be in certain place for the purpose of his kingdom. And he's saying right now, it is by his power that we are to bring to fruition whatever desires that he's placed in us. Desire for goodness, desire to fulfill our mission, to fulfill our calling. It is to be done by his power, not our own power. Sometimes we struggle even as believers because even when it comes to sin, we think that we can overcome sin on our own. That is not true. It's the power of the Holy Spirit that empowers us to overcome sin. Yes, it is wisdom, and he gives us the wisdom to stay away, to have boundaries, to do things that will keep us away from sin. But truly, deep inside, it is the power of the Holy Spirit that changes our desires, that changes us from what we used to love to what we now look at it like, I can't even stand it. You are now looking at somebody who could not sleep without finishing a whole bottle of wine in a day. And nowadays, when I look at it, I'm like, why? What's the point? It is not by my own power, but it's the power of the Holy Spirit that completely changed that desire. And it's not that I have to stop myself all the time. It's like, oh, I want it. I don't. No, it is no longer there completely disappeared by the power of the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit doesn't want us to do this on our own. It's because then there's no freedom. Then there is no joy in being a believer, in being in Christ. It's not about stopping ourselves from doing these things, but rather allowing the Holy Spirit power to walk with us in all our struggles, our sinful ways, so that he can change our desires. Amen? There is so much freedom in being in Christ. Meaning that it is not about using our own strength. It is the power of the Holy Spirit. But also some of us, we've been called into doing and influencing the the kingdom, to influencing our society, to influencing our cities and countries. And there is a huge calling in us. But God wants us to only use the power of the Holy Spirit, not of other humans and definitely not of other spirits. You know, there was this truth that I used to struggle and I used to tell people, I don't think that's true. I don't. But with days, statistically, do you know there are so many believers that will be here on Sunday and in the middle of the week, because of what is going on at their place of work, they go seek witch doctors. They go seek other spirits to add to the power. That is insulting to the Holy Spirit. He is God. He has all the power. As a believer, we have no business seeking power from anyone else rather than the Holy Spirit. And some of us, we just look away. And I know this is towards the end of the year. And many here 
in Tanzania, it's a culture that at the end of the year, you go to your village and, and in the village, they'll tell you, oh, there's all these traditions and things. They kill. There's a lot of rituals that are happening there. Some of us are blind to it, but some of us, we truly know what is truly happening. Seeking the dead spirit of your great grand great grandfather for wisdom or for health, for all of that. That is seeking power from other spirits that are so lower than the Holy Spirit that it is insulting to our Holy Spirit. We quench the power of the Holy Spirit in us when we seek power or we source power from anyone else other than him. Amen? So, we quench the Holy Spirit when we suppress his manifestation. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, let's read from verse 7 to 11. Paul writes this, Now to each one the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To each one, say to each one, to each one of us as a church, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. So there is a manifestation of the Spirit that is given to each one, but it is given for the common good, for the church, not just for my personal use. And he's now talking about the gifts that the Spirit gives to the church. Let's look at these gifts. He says, to one there is given the Spirit a message of wisdom. To another, a message of knowledge by the means of the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by that one Spirit. To another, miraculous powers to another prophecy, to another distinguishing between spirits, to another speaking in different kinds of tongues, and to, and to still another the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of one and the same spirit, and he distributes them to each one just as he determines. You see, the spirit is made visibly evident in our midst, whenever the gifts of the Holy Spirit are in use. When we use his gifts, then he is manifested. I truly believe that all these gifts that we've talked about here are distributed in this church right this very moment. There's a person in here with a gift of knowledge, a gift of wisdom, a gift of faith. And, and sometimes we wonder, it's like, aren't we all supposed to have faith? Yes, but there are people who have been given a special gift that their faith is to a completely different level. It's a gift. All of us are called to have faith. All of us are called to have wisdom. But there are those who have been given a power that when you hear them speak, you will know this is the wisdom that comes from the Holy Spirit himself. There are those who have been given a, a gift of knowledge where they'll know things that they're not supposed to know. And you wonder, how do you know this? And there are those who are given gifts of healing. When they pray, people get healing. And there are those who are given gifts of prophecy, distinguishing spirits, where immediately when someone enters, they'll know if this is a good, a Holy Spirit or another spirit. These gifts are all in this church, even right this very moment. The Holy Spirit has given these gifts to the church. But they are not for us to keep to ourselves. They are for us to use for the common good. But then, when we don't use them, when we are scared to use them, we quench the Spirit. I don't know about you, but I want our church to experience all that the Holy Spirit has for us. And I believe for that to happen, every single one of us has to be willing to be moved by the power of the Holy Spirit, have to be comfortable with the move of the, of the Holy Spirit. First of all, do we know that the Holy Spirit is constantly moving in our church? It's just about us aligning and sinking with the flow of the power of the Holy Spirit. 
He's constantly here. It's not like when we sing Holy Spirit come, that's when he comes. He's already here. Holy Spirit move, that's when he moves. He's already moving. It's us aligning ourselves to the move and the power of the Holy Spirit. Unfortunately, many of us do not embrace this influence and the manifestation of the Holy Spirit. And I think there are many reasons, but one of them is probably lack of knowledge, you know, of just knowing the Holy Spirit, being comfortable with the power of the Holy Spirit. And I trust and believe this is why God is pressing us through this series to learn and and dig deeper about the Holy Spirit so that we have, we are empowered with knowledge of who he is and what he does to know and be comfortable that when we are in prayer or we are in worship and somebody just starts weeping, that's just the power of the Holy Spirit and that's just normal. That I do not need to be scared. When people start praying with heavenly language, I do not need to be scared. That's just the move of the Holy Spirit. They're just in sync with the power of the Holy Spirit. This is how the power of the Holy Spirit manifests in them. We need just to be comfortable when we have the knowledge, enough knowledge. Like I said, these Sunday sermons are just introductions. It is up to you to go home and open your Bible and dig deeper and ask the Holy Spirit to continue to teach you about himself. But I also think it's not just lack of knowledge. There's also other things that are going on. I think we also do not embrace the manifestation of the power of the Holy Spirit because in a subtle way, we are ashamed. We are ashamed. Sometimes we are ashamed of how the Holy Spirit moves. Pastor Maddie, I'm, do you know I'm a director of a big company? What if my, my people see me being slain in spirit and falling on my knees and praying in weird language? We are ashamed. We are ashamed to be called that we go to a church that prays in tongue. We are ashamed that we'll be sitting next to someone who suddenly will be singing and they'll start crying. We are ashamed of how the spirit moves. And sometimes we even justify this, how the enemy is so crafty with this. And he'll tell us his wisdom. We justify this by saying we do not want to scare people away from the gospel. That we do not want people to come to our church and say, oh, that church is kind of weird. I don't want to go back. And then people won't come and they won't hear the gospel. They'll be turned off by the gospel. That's a lie from the pit of hell. Because, listen, on the day of the Pentecost, that's the day, if if we're going to talk about weird, let's talk about the day on the Pentecost. Tongues of fire on top of heads of people. Suddenly, for the very first time, people speaking of all these different languages. And yet, 3,000 souls came to Jesus. Read only that. What wisdom are we saying that if we stifle and quench the power of the Holy Spirit in our churches, it will help to bring people to Jesus? That's the exact opposite of what happened on the day of the Pentecost. And this is where the enemy wants us to be. No, be a sophisticated church. Be refined. Listen, when the Holy Spirit is moving, he knows the people he's convicting. That's not our job. Our job is to flow with his power. Our job is to witness to what is true, and he does the rest. He is the one who is convicting people. Now, I'm not going to say this and not address the fact that, yes, there are some people who would do weird, counterfeit move of the flesh to pretend it's the move of the Holy Spirit, and that will turn people away from the gospel. That is true. But that's not what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about the genuine move of the Holy Spirit, the genuine power of the Holy Spirit. And in this church, we are a church that is led by the Holy Spirit. So if you're going to bring the works of your flesh, 
the counterfeit work, the counterfeit move. Let me tell you, there are people in this church who have gifts of discernment. There are people in this church who have gifts of distinguished spirits. They will call you out. So don't you dare. Don't waste your time. We want the true move of the Holy Spirit, the true power of the Holy Spirit. We are not going to teach you how to speak in tongues. No, the Holy Spirit will give the gift of speaking in tongues as he wills. We do not need to fake it. We can still pray in English. That's okay. We can pray in Swahili. That's okay. We will not manufacture the move of the Holy Spirit, but we will also not quench the power and the move of the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. The enemy lies to us and scares us to tell us, no, you shouldn't do those things. But yet Jesus said, you will do greater things than these. And Jesus did weird things, turning water into wine. You know, feeding 5,000 people with just five loaves and two fish. Walking on water, weird things. And the enemy is like, no, don't be the weird church. Jesus said, I will send you a helper to empower you to do greater things. As a church, we ought to know that we have the power to do greater things. The power is already here. It's already moving. It's up to us to be in sync with. It's the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead that's living inside you and I. The same power is available today. See, the power of the Holy Spirit is given to the church through the gifts of the Holy Spirit so that we can witness of who Jesus is. When Jesus did all these miracles, when he did all these what we call weird things, it was because he was giving witness that he is the true Messiah. And when we use this power to do the same things, to allow the power of the Holy Spirit to function in us, we will witness of who Jesus is. To witness to the world, to draw people to Jesus. It will not turn people away from the gospel. That is not the truth. But I also think maybe we are so reserved when it comes to the power of the Holy Spirit because we want to esteem to the world. You know, we want to be accepted by the world. You know, we have, you know, we're not too bad. We are palatable. We are palatable church. You know, we're just, we're not very different from you guys out there, you know. We're very similar. We want to appeal to the world. And yet we say we are set apart. How? And sometimes we'll end up shutting down the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Because of this fear. You see, in the church in Thessalonica, there was a lot of prophecies going on. And they were really struggling a lot with the prophecies of when Jesus is coming back. You know, Jesus is coming back soon. And there was a lot of prophecies going on. And we believe that at some point, it was too much. And the church decided, you know what? No more prophecies. We'll just, you know, completely shut down whenever anybody prophesied. They will not believe. And this is why... Even Paul is telling them, do not treat prophecies with contempt. Instead, test them. Test them. So even for us, we're not going to be scared of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Instead, we will test them. Instead, we will make sure that it is the genuine, true move of the Holy Spirit. And this is why the Holy Spirit has given us the ability to do that. The gifts of discernment in the church, to be able to tell when it is truly the Holy Spirit, to distinguish spirits, to know if this is of God or if this is evil. We are a spirit-led church, and we will operate like one. It is time, church, 
for us to truly embrace who we are. We are not too refined for the Holy Spirit. We are not too intellectual for the Holy Spirit. We do not need to be palatable to the world. As a matter of fact, there's no one else who is as refined, as intellectual as the Holy Spirit. So if that's who we want to be, then we ought to embrace his power. It is time for us to stop just sipping from the overflowing power of the Holy Spirit. It is time for us to jump in and immerse ourselves in his power. It is time to stop suppressing the manifestation of the power of the Holy Spirit in our individual lives and as well as in the church. Because it starts with every single one of us. It starts with us at home, with our families. It starts with our connect groups. It starts with our places of work. Allow the Holy Spirit to function in you. Allow his gifts to be manifested through you, wherever you are. It is time to flow with the power of the Holy Spirit. Do not quench the Spirit of God. And lastly, we do quench the Spirit when we tolerate any unrepentant sin. This goes without saying. The Holy Spirit is here to sanctify us. So every time he convicts us and we ignore him, we disobey his convictions, then we are quenching the power of the Holy Spirit in us. Paul writes in Ephesians 4, verse 30 to 32, he says, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ God forgave you. We hinder the Holy Spirit when we allow ourselves to continue in sins that the Holy Spirit wants to empower us to walk away from. Sometimes it's the little compromises. It's the white lies. No one will notice. No one will miss this. No one will get hurt if I do this. But the truth is, someone does get hurt. The Holy Spirit is grieved. The one who lives inside you does not feel embraced when we tolerate unrepentant sin. Individually, but also as a church. See, the more on fire we are individually, the more ablaze our church will be. Revival starts individually and it spreads into the church. So each one of us is to flame the fire of the Holy Spirit inside us. Do not quench him. Flame the fire. Let us bow our heads. Maybe you've never experienced this fiery presence of the Holy Spirit inside you. Maybe the Holy Spirit is yet to take residence in you. I want to invite you this morning to hear this truth. We are all born sinners. From the time that Adam and Eve sinned, sin entered humanity. We are born sinners and we need reconciliation with God. But God has always had a plan to reconcile us to himself. He sent his son Jesus to pay for our sins. All we have to do is accept that payment, accept that forgiveness, and we will be reconciled with God. And it's at that point of reconciliation that the Holy Spirit will come and breathe new life into our spirit. A life that will never end. A life that is eternal. 
And it is that point that the Holy Spirit comes and resides in us and lives in us, empowers us, guides us through all truth, helps us and equips us to fulfill the calling that God has in our lives. Now, if you do not have that reconciliation with God, if you know Jesus is not your Lord and Savior, I want to give you this opportunity to do that. May you raise your hand so we can pray together. If you are in this room in overflow, amen. I see those hands. Keep them up. Keep them up. Boldly raise your hand. Today will be the day that your life changes forever. Church, let us pray. Dear God, I know I'm a sinner. I thank you for sending Jesus to die for my sins. Today, I choose to follow Jesus, to accept the forgiveness of my sins, that Jesus will be my Lord and my Savior. From this day, Holy Spirit, breathe into me a new life so that I may live for Jesus. From this day forward, I am born again. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen, amen, amen. Praise the Lord, church. Praise the Lord. Oh, we thank God for everyone who prayed this for the very first time. But also we praise God that all of us who know Jesus have had the opportunity to be reconciled with God. Praise God for that. Now before I go to church, I want to remind you that we must embrace the Holy Spirit fully by welcoming him despite the ridicule, the persecution, the fear of man, the temptation to sin, we must choose to embrace the Holy Spirit fully. Our lives will be set ablaze to shine forth the truth, the light, and the love of God to everyone we encounter. When we embrace the Holy Spirit, His fiery presence brings unity blessings and fellowship along with freedom and new life to the world. So if you desire to embrace the power of the Holy Spirit, if you desire as that for our church as much as I do, I want to invite you church for a three day of fast or three days of fast and prayer. And this will be this week, Thursday, Friday and Saturday. If you are willing, even that Saturday, to continue your fast until Sunday morning after service, I welcome to you to do that. How to fast? Please pray and ask the Holy Spirit. It will look different for each one of us. It's about your personal walk with the Holy Spirit. So pray and ask the Holy Spirit what times to fast and what kind of fast to do. But I welcome you to fast and pray for one prayer point. And that is for God to help us to yield to the yearning of the Holy Spirit. That all of us will yield to all that the Holy Spirit wants us to. That our church will be transformed. That our church will flow with the power of the Holy Spirit. That each one of us will be set ablaze for the kingdom of God. Church, I love you. God bless you. See you next Sunday.